I want to go to a very, very um, familiar passage of Scripture that, that most people, um, if you are just committed to doing what God would have us to do or have you to do, you might know this passage, or depending on what your framework is, be it in the urban or suburban context, but if you have a heart for doing what God would have you to be a, a do, I want you to take this passage, so let's just hear what it's saying. So go with me to the book of Micah, chapter 6. I'm just going to look at one verse of Scripture just to prayerfully motivate us all to be about the Father's business. So bear with me this morning. I have a lot to share with you, but I'm praying that what I have to share has nothing to do with what Felix want to say, but with everything with what God would have me say. So one verse of Scripture, and it reads as such, And he told, he has told you, O man, I'm reading from the ESV, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Let me read it again. And he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our Lord. I'm just going to say this passage has been heavy on my heart all week, and so I spent uh, all week just really digging into it, hearing what God would have to say, and I just want to share with you what the Lord has shared with me. So wherever you find yourself, if there's a person next to you or in the proximity, be it in the car, in your bedroom, I want you to reach over to them and I want you to tell them, say, neighbor, come on, say, put legs to the gospel. Yeah, wherever you find yourself, tell them again, say, neighbor, say, put legs to the gospel. Amen. My, my salvation experience, I'm just going to start here. My salvation experience is rooted in the work of, of Southern Baptist missionaries who came to the island where I found myself and evangelized the locals. They discipled them, and then they taught them to go and make disciples. So putting legs to that gospel in that context simply means what we did was we went door to door and knock on people's door and we told them about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ prayerfully with the intent that they would respond to the gospel by giving their life to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The gospel in that context was completely divorced from the cultural context of the residents. Let me tell you what that means. That means being saved meant that one transitioned from the world to the church. And there was no mixture of world and church. That relationship was mutually exclusive. And the two were diametrically opposed to each other. It was only after graduating high school and relocating to the United States for military and my collegiate education that I truly experienced what the world was like. Where I'm from, when you got saved, you came out of the world and you had nothing to do with it. And there was this line that says there's church and then there was world. In my early life in the United States, then I attended a missionary Baptist church, and I'm using those words intentionally because that's where, when Katani and I were dating, she made sure that I knew the Lord, so she sent me to church before she even went to church to date me. And, and when I was there, I would hear the preacher. Whenever we entered the service, they would do this call to worship, and they would say things like, enter to worship. And the expectation is that when you entered the context of the per inside perimeters of the building, it was a worship experience. But then after service, we would always hear the preacher say, depart to serve. And I'm sure if you grew up in church or you spend time in church like I did, you've heard the same things. Enter to worship and depart to serve. What I'm realizing, though, in life is most of us heard that, but I don't know that we really knew what the statement meant. Our focus was always the rituals of the church. Man, we had good worship. We had good annual days. We had good pastor's anniversary. We had all the good stuff. But putting legs to the gospel for us simply still meant we were divorced from the world and we had no dealings, no interaction, no participation with the, the, with the cares of the world. So I think I'm comfortable in saying, at least in my early life, the gospel had no legs to it. 
because legs to me meant still staying within the inside perimeters of this page and just talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but there was no connection to where people live and where people walk, and so there was no legs to the gospel. It was later on in life that I went on to obtain my Master of Divinity degree from Denver Seminary. And it was during the defense of my oral doctrines, when I was defending my oral, my doctrinal statement, there was this one person on my committee called Dr. Danny Carroll. And Dr. Carroll questioned me. Here is what he said to me as part of my oral defense. He says, Felix, what is your theology on issues of social concern? That subtle but pivotal question, it really, it, 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 it became the pivotal point that summarized the totality of my seminary experience. That, that question changed my life. It caused me to think. It caused me to process. It caused me to ponder. And, and matter of fact, that statement refined my call, and it has really shaped my assignment, assignment as it relates to pastoral ministry and what God has called me to do. Felix, he said, what is your theology on issues of social concern? What he was really saying to me is, Felix, what does putting legs to the gospel look like? to you. And, and I really had to think through that, and I really had to process that, because in that instance, I suddenly realized that all my theological training, right, all of my love for God, all of my rituals as it relates to my worship is insufficient to please God if I don't put legs to the gospel by loving God and loving the people that God loves. Amen. I want you all to hear me say that. It, it was Jesus. It was Jesus in his teaching on the mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, that amplified the point. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 7 and 12, right? He said, so in everything, and notice what he says, do to others as you would have them do for you, because why? This sums up the law and the prophet. I'm going to say it again because you're going to hear me say this a lot. He says, the entirety of the Old Testament, I want, to, I want you to see how, how thick that is, right? The entirety of the Old Testament is summed up in this statement, do to others as you would have them to do unto you, for so sums up the law and the prophet. On one occasion, when Jesus entered Jerusalem during his final days, he was asked by a scribe. He says, listen to the question. Hey, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus responded to him in Mark chapter 12. And if you go to Mark chapter 12, here's what Jesus said, right? He answered, the most important commandment is this. He says, hear, O Israel, that the Lord your God, the Lord, he is one right? And then he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and all your strength. And then the second one is like this. Hear this again. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he adds this, there is no other commandment that is greater than these. In other words, Jesus was saying, we put legs to the gospel, listen to the statement, when we love God, and then when we love God's people. You got to say that with me. Say, when we love God, and then when we love God's people, that's when we put legs to the gospel. I don't know if you realize this, but if you were to stay in the New Testament and jump all the way to the back, the whole tension between Paul and James and, and people try to make a big theological debate between what Paul taught as it relates to salvation by grace and what James is teaching about adding works to the grace. And we think that it's either one or the other. And I want you to hear me say it's a both and. So here's how James says it, right? James says it in James chapter 2, verses 14. He raises, he says this question. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but they have no deeds or works? And then he, he asks this question, can such faith save them? And then listen to this. 
Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food, and if one of you say to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? In the same way, I love this, faith by itself, this is Paul, if it's not accompanied by action, which is what James comes in, it is dead. So it seems to me it takes a combination of faith, believing in God, and the addition of works or action for me to put legs to my gospel for this gospel to be realized. So having a proper theology on issues of social concern is paramount if any believers is to put leg to, to the gospel. In other, in other words, listen to this, loving God while remaining silent on issues of social concern is not enough to prove that I am a Christian. I want you to hear me say this. I can say I love God all I want. I can, I can say I care about God, I worship God, I tithe, I pray. But if, if, if I stay silent on, on issues of social concern, and if I stay silent when I see things happening, I'm going to use an interesting word, in the community, I have to raise the question, where is my faith? Is my faith genuine? Is my faith authentic? Am I being true to the Word of God? You see, as we transition back to the Old Testament, that was the issue that the prophet Micah faced at the time when he wrote the book. If you attended the worship experience in Micah's day, you would experience nothing but ritualistic worship. You would experience the, Jew, the Jewish rabbi. He would be sitting in circular fashion reading and expositing the, the, the Torah. And the assembly no doubt consisted of devout worshipers. And these were people who loved God. But hear this. They attended the assembly out of tradition. That's what they were supposed to do. That's what they were used to doing. And the experience no doubt consisted of prayers to God and, and songs celebrating the faithfulness of God in delivering the Egyptians from Israel, I mean the, the, the Israelites from Egyptian captivity and Babylonian captivity. But I seriously doubt there were any testimonies being shared about the faithfulness of God in that day. I believe that I'm on the safe side in saying that it was church as usual. In other words, here's what's happening in that context, right? The poor in Micah's day were being neglected, and people were being treated unfairly, and loyal love was not being experienced in the community. Walking in humility was not commonplace. Matter of fact, nobody was out in the community protesting because the poor were being served in justice. Nobody was marching in front of the church and in front of the governmental places to say we ought to change things. Nobody was seeking justice for those who were not receiving justice. And that was a problem in Micah's day. So God raises up the prophet. And God says to Micah, I need you to proclaim the words that's stated in our text today. And in other words, God is saying to Micah, I want you to go to the Israelites. I want you to go to the tribe of Judah. And I want you to say to them, listen, I get that you love me. I get that you care about me. I get that you worship me. I get that I play a place in your life. But I need you to stop the rituals, and I want you to learn to put legs to the gospel. I wish I had somebody in here. And I want you to get to the place where the gospel is not only about the songs that you sing and the prayer that you offer and the sacrifices that you render. Those are all good, but if there's no legs to what you're saying, if there's no legs to what you're doing, it's just a said faith and not a lived out faith. So the call is to make a difference. And so now, when we go to our text that's in front of us today, and I want to read that text again. If you look at it in Micah 6 and 8, here's what the text says. Has he told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? And listen to this. But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly before our Lord. I want to say it again. What does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, 
and to walk humbly before our Lord. There's a couple of commentators, before I even go into the text, that said some profound things about this passage that's very similar to what Jesus said when he says to love God and to love God's people. Here in his commentary in the Old Testament, Von Rod says it this way. He says, this verse is the embodiment of the commandments as the prophet understood them, right? In other words, this verse summarizes everything that the prophets were saying. Listen to this other commentator. In his commentary in the book of Micah, J.P. Smith, he says this. This verse, he says, the finest summary of the content of practical religion is to be found in the Old Testament in this passage, right? Now listen to this last one. In, in, the book, in, in the book, the reading of the Old Testament brought, the author, he says this. He says, rabbis who commented on this verse in the early centuries of the Christian era called it this. It is a one-line summary of the entire law, okay? In other words, Micah 6.8, what they're saying about Micah 6.8 is that it summarizes everything Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy teaches as it relates to what God would have them to do. Now, I find that this verse is critical to our understanding if we're going to put legs to the gospel. Yet, I find that very few people in Christendom, in Christianity, are willing to leave their comfort zone, I want you to hear me say, and put into practice what it teaches. For me, it's comfortable just to come in the confines of Restoration Christian Fellowship and enjoy the best worship team this side of Mississippi. It's good just to come in here and enjoy great service and great ministry and great people. But when it comes to putting legs to the gospel, I don't know that I'm so comfortable to go out there and do what God has called me to do. So what do I do? I hide behind the fact where I want to say to tell people, Jesus loves you, but I'm not willing to do nothing about it. Come on, I wish I had somebody in here. I want to pray for you, but I'm not willing to do anything about it. So it's time that we learn what it means to put legs to the gospel. So the question then is raised, preacher, if I'm going to put legs to the gospel, how do you suggest that we put legs to the gospel? Three simple things that the verse talks about. The first thing is this. If we're going to put legs to the gospel, we put legs to the gospel when we do justice. I want you to hear that text carefully. We put leg to the gospel, legs to the gospel when we do justice. And hear me say this. The first thing God requires of Micah is oriented around the human community. In other words, the Old Testament believers, they were part of other faithful individuals, and they were all bound together by a common membership of a covenant relationship with God. In other words, when God looked at the nation of Israel and the people of Israel, he didn't see a diverse or broken up group of people. He saw community. And social and moral standards were laid down for the individuals to practice in their relation and in their companion with faith. In other words, Commitment to God also included commitment to the community. Let me say it again. I showed that I love God based on my commitment to God's people. Let me say it again. In other words, if I love God, I had no choice but to love God. Yeah, y'all get it, God's people. You got to get that. It's very, very important. And, and, and justice, when I say do justice, it is the key word that is so often used by the prophets to sum up what the social obligation looks like. In other words, it covers and transcends a host of negative precepts such as prohibition of oppression. In other words, if I'm in the community, I couldn't oppress people that were part of God's community. I, I couldn't perjure. I couldn't bribe. It calls for a sense of responsibility toward weaker members of society and it insists on the right, it insists on the right of others and it demands an instinct towards social preservation. Let me 
explain that. So here's this. Justice then, when it says do justice, when Micah was saying God is saying to do justice, here's what he was saying. It is rendering to everyone that which is due him or her. Justice, it was different from equity in that where justice means doing those positive things the law demands, equity means doing what is fair and right in every separate case. Okay, so justice means to do the just thing myself. So here's what that means. Here's what that means. If I love God and I love God people, I couldn't pray for someone else to do justice. I was responsible. I wish I had somebody in here to do justice myself. So justice provides vindication and deliverance, and it creates a community in addition to retribution. Here's what that means. Justice is associated with the basic requirements in community life. Basic needs, needs that are basic, basic rights. Everyone within the community deserves to have access to these basic rights. This means I had a right in that community to live wherever I chose. I wish I had somebody in here. I had a right to go to whatever school I wanted to. Come on, I wish I had somebody in that community. I had a right to get whatever job I wanted to regardless of what I look like or my ethnicity. I wish I had somebody in here. I had a right to fair pay. I wish I, regardless of who I was working beside. I had a right to fair defense from the law regardless of what the situation was. I had a right not to be harassed by law enforcement because of what I look like racially. I wish I had somebody in here. I had a right not to be followed because of the color of my skin. I wish I had someone in here. I had a right not to be denied alone because of what I look like and where I live and where I went to school. That was what justice looked like and what God was calling for in the days of my Micah. And we miss that. We miss that. Justice is deliverance. It is rectifying this gross social inequality that exists with the disadvantage. It puts an end to the conditions that produces these injustices. That's it. It, it, it addresses this, and it says in justice, everyone belongs in the community. Everyone is treated fairly in the community because God loves them. We have no choice but to love each other. And if I'm going to put legs to the gospel, I've got to learn what it means to do justice. I wish I had a witness here. You don't have to bear with me because I'm passionate about this. The people of God are called to do justice. Why? Because God is just. Come on, God treats his entire creation with equity because that is who the character of God is. And God's expectation is that his covenant community, we exemplify those same character traits to each other. We can't say God is just and I don't have to be just. Come on, does he live in you? If he lives in you, we have no up, 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 up. We, we cannot say we cannot be just. Doing justice is putting legs to the gospel. When we do justice, we see each other through God's eyes. You're an image bearer, and I'm an image bearer, and we're an image bearer. Regardless of whether you're Hispanic or black or Asian or Italian or white, it doesn't matter what your complexion is. We're image bearer, and we do God. I'll tell you what, in case you're secured in a bunker in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and you're shielded by it from all the protests that's occurring around these past few weeks, I want you to hear me say the world is asking for justice and all the systemic racism that have been in existence for over 400 years. It is time for justice, and God is calling for the church to stand up and fight for that same justice. Martin Luther King, in his letters from a Birmingham jail, he is quoted as saying, Justice too long delayed is what? Justice denied. That means if you're choosing to remain silent and you name the name of God, you are making the choice to deny justice. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me say it. So here's what Micah, he says, do justice. This means the people of God can no longer say 
we love God and remain silent. Today, it is time to put legs to the gospel and join forces across ethnic lines and fight for justice for those in our community who have been pleading for justice for over 400 years. Let's change the system that continually perpetuates hate and division, and let's start treating people fairly. Let's do the right thing. It is time for God's church to stand up and put legs to the gospel. Being saved should not only involve me living in heaven with God, but it should include me doing life together on earth. This is only possible when the church decides to band together and do justice for the, le for the less fortunate. That was number one. If you're going to put legs to the gospel, we got to be able to do justice. Here's the second thing. If we're going to put legs to the gospel, we, we must love kindness. And, and some of your translation says do mercy. But it's the same thing. I want, I, let, me, let, me, let me take a moment with this. For Hebrew, the kindness is the word has said, and it essentially means and primarily means faithful covenant love. This speaks to, once again, obligations to people within the community of God. Okay, hesed means it's a word of relationship expressing an attitude of covenant obligation. Fundamentally, here's what it says that it describes God's love that will not let me go. And I love that. The firm, faithful loyalty of God toward his people. Listen to this. There is nothing I can do that will cause God to turn his back on me. That, that's her said, right? There's nothing I can do that will cause God to stop loving me. And in community, God expects that we do the same thing. Here's the interesting thing about that Hebrew word, hased. Kindness is a quality shown in the way a person speaks and acts. Listen to this. It is more volitional than it is emotional. Let, let me explain that because here's what that means. If I am supposed to respond based on emotion, there's going to be times when I don't feel like liking you. Right? But since Hasid speaks to a volitional response, I have to love you regardless of whether I want to or not, regardless of whether I feel like it or not. It is an act of my will, not based on emotion. Y'all not getting this, because sometimes in my life I make God angry, but I thank God that he doesn't respond with his love based on emotion. He makes the intentional volitional choice to love me in spite of my behavior. And God is calling us, secondly, to respond in that way. Listen to this quote by, by Mr. Robinson, right? In Two Prophets, he says this. It expresses the moral bondage of love, the love and discharge of an admitted obligation. And I like this last part. The voluntary acceptance of responsibility. Let me say it again. Has said says this. The voluntary acceptance of a responsibility. Understand me. Understand me. God voluntarily accepted the responsibility of the sin of mankind and took it upon himself to do justice by dying on Calvary for my sins. This means he was so committed to his love, love kindness, right, that, 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 that he was no longer, he no longer remained silent in heaven, but he literally put legs to the gospel and did something about my sin by dying on Calvary. I wish I had somebody in here. Here's how John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, Y'all know it, y'all know it, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should what? Not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. The problem with the text is we love to quote it and we love to hear it, but we really don't know what it means. So let me help you with what it means, right? What, what it means is that God took the responsibility for something he did not do. Oh my goodness, y'all not getting this, y'all not getting this, right? And out of justice, 
because of his love for kindness, he goes on the cross and he dies in the place of sinful people just to bring justice to the community and to bring me, a Gentile, into right relationship with his chosen people. So here's how Corinthians says it. Corinthians put it this way in Corinthians 5.21. It says this, For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me help you with this by way of application. The church of God can no longer remain silent by saying racism is not my problem. It can no longer say my parents did not own slaves. It can no longer say I had nothing to do with the t- that. The church must be willing to put legs to the gospel by taking hit the hit for the sake of the kingdom. I want you to hear me say that. Love and kindness means this. The voluntarily acceptance of responsibility. That means in community, if you've got a problem, I've got a problem. I want you to hear me say it. If you're being mistreated, I've got to stand up regardless of whether I did the wrong to you or not. I am fighting for your rights so you can be right because we're in the same community. And we miss this because God demonstrated that for us with what he did in case you still don't get the protest that's ongoing today that was initiated by the killing of a black man at the hands of law enforcement. Listen to this. This is the world's way of showing his seed. They don't know what that is, but they're saying enough is enough. And they're stopping their silence by saying we can't do this no more. The protest across across ethnic lines is the world saying enough is enough. We cannot tolerate this no more. Love and kindness calls for the church of God to do the same. The people of God, the believers that look like me and that look like you, and all of us that say we care about the people of God, we can't sit in our circles every Sunday singing kumbaya while people are being treated unjustly. The word says do justice and show love and kindness. It is time to make a difference, times for a change, and we need to start putting legs to the gospel by loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. I'm almost done. Here's the third thing I want to share with you. And the third thing is this. If we're going to put legs to the gospel, then we must learn what it means to walk humbly before God. Let me say this, and I'm going to let the Scripture talk. It requires humility for me to say, all the years of my Christian journey, I thought I had it right. But it requires humility for me to say, What I thought was right was not enough. I want you to hear me say that. It takes humility for me to say, I'm going to fight for the less fortunate. I'm going to fight for the disenfranchised. I'm going to fight for the least of these. It takes humility for me to recognize that I might have been wrong in saying black lives didn't matter, but black lives does matter and lives matter. I want you to hear me say that the people of God matter because we're made in the image of God. It takes humility for me to start saying it is time to do justice. It is time to start loving people I don't love. It's time for me to start loving people I don't understand. It's time for me to start making a difference. It takes humility to do that. And when I think about it, I can't help but reflect on what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2. And I want to read this because I think this is so important and I want to let this resonate in your spirit. Here's what the scripture says in Philippians chapter 2 looking at verses 1. I'm just going to read down to verse 1 to, to 8. Here's what it says. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being like-minded or of the same mind, having the same love, being a full accord and of one mind. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. I got to put a parenthetic pause here. 
Because this is saying to me that when I see the person on the street, I've got to be humble enough to realize, but for the grace of God, I'm not in that situation. Come on. But for the grace of God, I'm not the next alcoholic or the next drug addict or the next pimp or the next, but for the grace of God. And, and we all need to be able to say that when we look at this, right? It says here, look, each person ought to look not on their own interests, but also on the interests of others. Oh, my goodness. Verse 5, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Some translation says he made himself no, of no reputation, and he took on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Let me go ahead and give him a name that is above every name. Man, I don't know if you get this. It doesn't get no higher than being in heaven. It doesn't get no higher than being in the highest place in heaven, on the throne with God. But then you look down at the earth and you see all the injustices in earth being caused by sin. You see everything that's wrong with the earth. And, 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 and you, you, you remain silent for 400 years. I want you to hear me say this. When you look at what was going on in the Bible, you remain silent for many. But then one day, God decides to get up off his throne. And he didn't come down in all of his godly garment. He clothed himself in flesh. And I want you to hear me. And he protested amongst us. He walked amongst us. But then here's the interesting thing. Then he goes on the cross and he takes the hit for sins he did not commit. You guys are wrong. You guys are this. You guys are that. But because I'm commended and justice is who I am, loving kindness is who I am, out of humility, kill me instead of them so we can make it right. And if God did that for us, excuse the term, but who in the heck do we think we are? Not to do it for our brothers and sisters. And then we have God in us, and we say we love God? Back to James. If you have faith, but no deeds, what good is it? It's dead. You're fooling yourself. Put legs to the gospel. Remember my question from Dr. Carroll when I was doing my MDiv orals? Dr. Carroll says, Felix, what's your theology on issues of social concern? I had to process that. I had to process that because I'd been in church all my life, and it was all about church, all about church. Just about to graduate seminary, and right before I graduate, they say, pretty much, what does putting legs to the gospel look like for you? And in that instance, I said to you, my life was transformed my ministry was transformed, and everything about me theologically changed because here's what my position on the theology of social concern looks like. I got to do justice. I got to love kindness, and I've got to do it all out humility. So here's what that means. There's no way I can say I'm saved and remain silent when issues of social concern is plaguing my community. That's what it looks like. And I want to invite you to join me in that. Because I think that's what the Word of God is. That's what was happening in Micah's day. And God raises up this prophet and say, tell the people, your worship is for real. But y'all ain't doing nothing. <laughs> Do something about it. My prayer today is as the Word of God has gone forth. In this season, in this time, there's a kairos moment of God where we have a chance to change some systems. And we have a chance to end some oppression that's been going on for a long time. And we can battle some things at the core. My prayer is that the church of God together will put legs to the gospel. And let's end this. Let's end this. Let's end this. But it'll only happen if we fight together. Calvary was all about the forgiveness of sins. But it was also all about 
us putting an end to all the social injustices and the systems of inequities that exist in our culture. And I believe the church ought to be a part of that fight in leading the way. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you're an awesome God. You're a wonderful God, Lord. We're called to put legs to this gospel, God, and sometimes it's scary because you've been silent for so long. Sometimes we don't know how to fight because we think it's not our fight. Sometimes we question, should we be involved? Should we do whatever we should do? But God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you're doing. My prayer, God, is the people of God, the church of God in suburbia and in the urban context and wherever we find ourselves, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, that we can lock arms and come together and say we love God. And I get it, I get it, understand right now our people of African-American descent, Lord, because for 400 years, God, they've been deprived of the injustices. Let's stand, God, together across ethnic lines. For that people group, let's not try to water it down with anything else. Call it for what it is. Let's fix it. So I thank you for those businessmen and those leaders in our country and those leaders in society, the NFL and Amazon and people that are not afraid to say enough is enough. Black lives really matter. Let's stop this. Let's stop it. Let's stop it. May the church make the same sound. May the church say the same things. Because next it could be Asians, and we've got to say Asian lives matter. And it could be Mexicans, and we've got to say Mexican lives matter. It could be the Indian. We've got to say Indian lives matter, God. Who knows what's next? But if we don't end it now, we leave the Pandora box open for anything to happen. So God, forgive us for our sins of silence. Forgive us for our sins of not doing justice of not loving kindness, of not walking humbly. We covenant to put legs to the gospel and be who you would have us to be, God. It is in your name we pray. Amen. I just want to say thank you for listening and for being a part of what God is doing this morning. If you heard that word and you're saying, Pastor Felix, what do I do? I'm just going to say, hey, we've got people in chat rooms. we got people online. Reach out to someone. Call our church office. We'd love to talk. We're praying about how this ministry can have societal impact, partnering with others. Not that we've got to take it on ourselves. Collaborative partnership is what it takes. We can lead together. We can move together. But if you heard that word and you have not said yes to God, I want to give you a chance to give your life to him and say yes to him. All you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins and come into my life and save me and know that he will do that. So hear me. I'm not saying salvation is by works. Salvation is by grace, through faith, not works. But after you're saved, there's work to do. You got to get it because the work is a demonstration of your salvation. So thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to partner with us in giving. Many ways to give. You can text give RCF to 73256. We need your support to keep this word coming to you. You can go to our website. You can give on our website. Um, you can click the give button if you're on the network. You can call However you can, we solicit your support that God would move and have his way. And don't forget that this Saturday is our food bank because of the 4th of July. If you find yourself in need, we have great men and women led by Deacon Booth that's out here to serve. So if you're in this pandemic, you're struggling, come get something so we can serve you. There's no pride in that. We want to be what God would have you to be. Thank you for joining us. We're going to flesh this conversation out Wednesday. So join us at 7. We'll talk about this some more, what it means to put legs on the gospel. And I might have just a unique group of individuals with me that specializes in this subject matter, and we'll talk about it. So thank you for joining me. God bless you. Looking forward to see you on Wednesday night. God get the glory.